All right, it looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And on Standing for Truth, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. We host interviews, debates, discussions, and more. And so if you're not yet subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And also please share around this content as the truth is so important. Now, today we have a great show for everybody. Our guest tonight is a fantastic speaker with a ton of experience when it comes to creation versus evolution. He understands and appreciates God's word, and he is very well studied and very well informed on the science of creation, evolution, and the age of the earth. It is a privilege to have Russ Miller with me for today's very important presentation. The topic we will be focusing on is evidence for the flood, the Grand Canyon and Grand Staircase. Russ Miller, welcome to the show and thank you so much for giving us your time for today. Hi Donnie and hi George as well. It's a pleasure to be a part of your program today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, Russ. Looking forward to this. we got a great chat who are also looking forward to this. You're kind of a fan favorite, and we've already got questions flying in, so today is going to be fun. And I've also got here with me today our award-winning co-host, George Bond himself. George, good to have you here with us today. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks for waking, up, uh, waking me up early. And um, just to make you feel better, Russ, you're one of the esteemed people that we've interviewed, so it's great to have people like you on the show. And uh, true to my form, Russ, I'm, I usually start off with a little joke. Some people don't like them, some don't, but <laughs> here we go. So the other, the other day I told my wife, <clears throat> when I look into the mirror, I only see an old man. I need you to make me feel better, I said. So she, she came back and replied, you have perfect eyesight. No. <laughs> did, did that make you feel better? <laughs> Not really, no. Uh, You're feeling but, but, worse today, aren't you, George? <laughs> but, Russ, uh, I'll be in the background. I'll, I'll be collecting questions from people. But from time to time, I usually add, add a bit to the discussion. And at the end of it, I'd like to share some recent uh, research that was done by John Mackay. Uh, flume experiments that uh, really turned the uh, stratification issue upside down, really. Um, but I'll leave that as a surprise towards the end. Mm, sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate that, George. Uh, laughter is the best medicine, and that's why we have you here with us during these programs. So I appreciate it. And before we get into Russ's uh, must-watch and very important presentation here. I want to give our guest a brief introduction. Now, Russ has shared thousands of church service messages, authored five creation-oriented books, including The Cost, written and illustrated two kids' coloring books, developed 16 PowerPoint seminars, a DVD series and study guide, his Grand Canyon Rim, Raft, and Grand Staircase tours, hundreds of radio programs, led dozens of Grand Canyon creation-based river raft trips, and more. 
Russ has spoken on college campuses, at national conferences, and appeared on many worldwide Christian tele, uh, television programs. He also has a daily post on Facebook and Twitter, always encouraging people to believe the Bible word for word and cover to cover. Russ has 174 college credits and is an effective communicator with kids, teens, college students, and adults. In fact, sharing the information in easy to understand messages is his best gift. After building a successful nationwide firm, Russ gave it away in 2000 to form CESM. A former theistic evolutionist, Russ now ministers to Christians and non-Christians alike, stating, I am not attacking anyone who has been misled into believing in Darwinism, theistic evolution, or progressive creation. I am here to help them just as someone helped me. Now, you can find uh, this introduction and more over on creationministries.org. Russ, again, thank you so much for being here. And I want to hand it over to you for your presentation. And of course, if you would like uh, some additional words in terms of introduction. Well, thank you very much, Donnie. I, I appreciate that. And again, I'm honored to be a part of your program. So I actually uh, put this message uh, together from bits and pieces from other uh, messages uh, this morning for your program. And I want to uh, talk about the global flood, its role in the war of worldviews between the secular view and the biblical view. Uh, what I want to show folks is actually the global flood is a linchpin in this war of worldviews. So I'll, I'll spell that out and show that over the next few minutes. I want to go through some uh, evidences and some biblical statements before we actually get to the Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase, which most people have probably never heard of, but both are really monuments to the truth and the authority of, of God's word. So let me go ahead and, and start. You know, first of all, whenever I talk about uh, science in the Bible, I like to point out that the Bible is not a science book but it is the true history book of the universe. So whenever the Bible makes a statement that can be scientifically tested, studied, or observed, if it's the true word of God, it should hold up. And there's actually dozens of tidbits found in the Bible that science finally caught up with up to 3,000 years after Scripture told us it was so. Um, just for one example, the Bible contains 83 verses about the need for cleanliness to prevent the spread of illnesses and disease. But these verses were written over 3,000 years before we discovered germs. In fact, those verses out of Leviticus were primarily responsible for stopping the great plagues that killed millions in Europe. So the Bible holds up fine to scientific discoveries. The, where, and I'm gonna talk about the difference between operational and historical sciences in just a moment. Um, a, a fair question is, are science and the Bible at odds with one another? Because today we are told that they are in conflict. And I actually wanna show people that, that what I call real science, operational science is a believer's true friend. Operational science, what most people think of when we hear the word science, is knowledge that has been derived from the study of observable, testable, repeatable evidences. Something needs to be observable and testable for the findings to truly be science. And that knowledge derived from that observation and testing is operational science. It's led to many of the great improvements we've made over the, the past several hundred years. Most people today don't realize this. In fact, I'll speak in a secular school, and when I first go up to the podium, uh, the kids are just cross-armed glaring at me and mad, which always strikes me as being rather odd because I'm only there to show them that maybe there's a better way to look at the evidence, but they've been so indoctrinated that they're, they're mad before they even hear anything I have to say. And God just gave this to me. I walked up to a podium one time, and all the kids were glaring at me with crossed arms. And the first thing I said was, hey, let me ask you all a question. How many of the branches of modern science 
and there's 200 or so branches. How many of those branches do you guys think were started by Christians? And usually they, someone yells out, none. <laughs> and then I point out, actually, over 80% of the branches of modern science were started by Christians in order to study God's creation. And that just melts the cross arms and the mad looks on their faces. And all of a sudden, it just opens up their minds to, wait a minute, how come we've never heard any of this? And I just point out, you're involved in a war of worldviews, and the secular or the humanist side owns the system today, and they teach uh, what they want to teach as science. And think about it. They, they think random chance brought us about and the magic ingredient lots of time. But how would you set out to study random chance? You can't. What, what started modern science were Christians who realized we have an intelligent creator, and he probably put some laws and, and formulas in place to govern his creation. And if we study the creation, they call that nature today, we could discover some of those things and put them into practice. And that is what led to modern science as Christians began roughly 82% of the branches of modern science, the greatest scientist of all time, Isaac Newton, the father of the, of the scientific method, Francis Bacon, Louis Pasteur, and on and on we can go. Uh, many of the great science scientists of the past were, were staunch Christians. So let's go to uh, 2 Peter 3 in the New Testament. I want to show you a fantastic uh, prophecy given to us about 1900 years ago. And in the Bible, I should point out, is the only book in the history of the world that lives on its ability to correctly predict the future. Up to 2,000 prophecies have been made, depending on how you add them up, and over 90% of them have already come true with 100% accuracy. In fact, the Bible says the way you can tell the Word of God from all false uh, teachings is the prophecies will come true. The false teachings or prophecies will fail. Maybe one out of five come true and four out of five fail, but the Bible is almost 2,000 for 2,000. Uh, one of the great prophecies in the New Testament is there will come in the last days scoffers. Well, we certainly see lots of scoffers today, right? And Second Peter says they're going to be saying, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase this, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The Bible foretold 1,900 years ago, that in the last days, non-believers were going to come along claiming all processes remain the same as they've been since the beginning. Well, that's today known as uniformity. Um, things that we see today have been pretty uniform with the way the rates were in the past. Or if you like big words, it's called uniformitarianism. But things are going to be the same, uniformity. Today, the secular side claims that the present, present processes are key to understanding the past, the past processes. And this was foretold in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. And that brings us to not operational science, but historical science. I'll speak on a college campus and the science students will say, we've never heard of historical science. And I say, exactly. That's why I said, I'm going to show you things that you're not being told. Now, historical science are, is not knowledge derived from the study of evidence. It is assumptions derived from applying operational science, things that you can test, study, and observe today, operational science, and, and applying what you find in operational science to non-observable events from the past. Well, the, the assumptions derived here in historical science lead to the um, erroneous conclusions they often come up with. Uh, the bias of whoever the interpreter of the evidence is, and it's usually that bias is usually based on uniformity. The present rates are the same as they've always been, corrupt the non-observed assumptions of historical science. Christianity and operational science are not in conflict. Conflict comes when we are talking about historical science. That's where there's conflict between God's word and what they deem as science today. Well, today, a lot of biology and a great deal of geology are actually historical sciences, trying to take things we can see and observe today and apply them to past events that were not observed. Jesus told us in the book of John that Moses wrote of me. We need to understand the foundational issues to understand why all of this matters. Uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis, 
uh, penned by Moses, we're told that God gave us a perfect creation. Now, it was perfect. It, I think this is almost beyond human comprehension, but try to imagine a perfect creation with no death, no suffering in it. You know, one of the first questions a good scoffer will ask a kid in college to undermine their faith is, hey, how can you have a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? In fact, many of us, something terrible happens to someone we love or care about, or we see something evil take place in the world today. And a fair question is, how can there be a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? Well, we have to go back to the book of Moses or the book of Genesis penned by Moses to understand this. And here's the biblical answer. If folks listening today leave this with nothing else, know how to biblically answer that question. How can we have a loving God in a world full of death and suffering? And the answer is right here in the early chapters of Genesis. God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. What happened to it was Adam's original sin. It was Adam's first sin that corrupted the creation allowing death to enter. And that's why we live in a world full of death and suffering today, yet we have a loving creator. And that's the biblical response to that question of how can there be a loving God in a world full of death and suffering? Now, the answer, though, should continue on from there. It was Adam's original sin that brought in death, corrupting the creation. But that original sin also separated us from God. Adam walked in the garden with God. We don't walk in the garden with God today because that original sin separated man from God. And this required that we be reunited or redeemed with him. Well, we've got a big problem there. You have to be absolutely righteous, perfect, without sin to be redeemed with God. And we can't do that. We've inherited our sin nature from Adam and we've all sinned. If you've ever said something that wasn't true, you've lied. If you've ever taken something that didn't belong to you, even a, a, a sticky note you, you've stolen, we have all sinned. So God is so loving that despite our sin that corrupted his creation and separated us from him, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die, taking our death penalty so that those who believe in Jesus, accepting Jesus and his sacrifice, believing in him as our Lord and Savior, can be redeemed with him for eternity in heaven. That's the foundation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, who is our loving God, creator, and Savior. Now, Moses also told us, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Well, that would be a global flood. Now, had there been a global flood, I would expect the evidence to be overwhelming. I would think that the crust, the surface of the earth that we live on and walk on, would be made up of sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by the moving water uh, you ever seen a miner with a pan? He scoops up some sediments and some water and he sloshes the pan back and forth. Well, that moving water stratifies out the sediments in his pan by grain size, weight, and density. Gold being the densest will fall to the bottom. Well, on a global scale, the year-long floodwaters would have been eroding the surface of the original creation and would have been moving these sediments around the planet, stratifying them out by grain size, weight, and density, and then laying them down in the second half of the flood primarily. So instead of having one big brown conglomerate making up the crust of the earth as if it had formed slowly over long ages of time, you would have stratified sediments. You'd have all the shale together making shale layers, all the sandstones making sandstone layers, all the mudstones making mudstone layers, the limestone making limestone layers. You'd have the stratified layers laid down by water had there been a global flood. And those layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density would be full of billions of things that were drowned and buried so quickly that they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. And what we find today is the outer crust of the earth, those sedimentary layers are full of billions of dead things that we call fossils that were drowned and buried so quickly, they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I was speaking at a church in California a couple of weeks ago, and I started to drive out. I got about four miles from my house, and there was a raccoon that someone had run over right in the middle of the road, dead as a doornail. 
I came back four days later, scavengers had already eaten it. It didn't lay there for millions of years waiting for sediments to slowly build up around it so it become, could become a fossil. Things have to be buried immediately to be preserved so they can be fossilized. It's really no wonder Jesus said, if you believe not Moses' writings, how should you believe my words? Well, why would it be important to believe Moses in order to believe Jesus? Well, let's take a look at what I call the humanistic worldview. You could call it the secular worldview as well, or even the atheistic worldview. But the humanist worldview is based on those exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water that make up the crust of the earth. You know, Donnie, all the time people ask me, hey, Russ, what evidence do you have that the Bible's true? I always say, well, I have the exact same evidence that atheists use to say it's not true. I mean, think about it. Don't we all live in the exact same world? So don't we all have the exact same evidence? You know, it's, it's never been about who has the evidence. The issue is who gets to interpret the evidence. It's the interpretations of the evidence that uh, can mislead people. Uh, the humanistic worldview, based on the exact same sedimentary layers laid down by water that I think are great proof of the global flood, they just interpret it through their belief system, which is, hey, there was never a global flood. Those layers form slowly over millions and billions of years of time before man evolved on his own. So it's not the evidence, it's the interpretation of the evidence. Now, from a Christian standpoint, the old earth beliefs, though, that say we evolved through millions of years of death and suffering, or even if you believe we were created through millions of years of death and suffering, you've just put death before Adam. Well, see, once you put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam's sin brought in death, separating us from God, requiring our redemption. So you've done great harm to people's faith in what eventually leads, in this case, undermines the gospel message. It's an important issue. How did those layers form? Atheists seem to understand this better than most Christians. This from uh, an article in um, American Atheist titled The Meaning of Evolution. And he stated, destroy the original sin by putting death before mankind. And in the rubble, you'll find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, and millions of years of beliefs that put death before man, then Christianity is nothing. And I agree with that statement 100%, which is why it's important to stand firm on the truth and show people why we can trust God's word and how real science, operational-based science, is a believer's true friend. Always has been, always will be. In fact, this world-renowned atheist speaker and, and former Harvard uh, biology professor uh, stated, the revolution against Christianity, is what he's talking about, began when it became obvious Earth was ancient rather than having been created 6,000 years ago. He said this finding, old Earth beliefs, were the snowball that started the entire avalanche. The age of the Earth is vital. It's the foundation of the humanist atheist worldview and it puts death before Adam, which undermines people's faith in the gospel message. So the question really becomes, did Adam's sin bring death into the world, separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus' death on the cross, or did millions of years of death bring man into the world? Well, 1 Thessalonians tells us to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So let's do that. I've got one of my messages, the top 10 pillars of millions of years beliefs, which I also call the top 10 pillars of death before Adam beliefs. We're going to look at just uh, two or three of those today. Again, back to 2 Peter. They'll come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of Jesus' return? For since the fathers fell asleep, since they died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Again, that's uniformity. So they look today, historical science, and they see that the stratified layers are forming at roughly one inch per thousand years. Then in historical science, they take the current rate, thinking the present is the key to the past. Look at this, the depth of the stratified layers making up the crust of the earth, 
and figuring it's always been the same uniformity, one inch per thousand years, they come up with the ages for those stratified layers. <clears throat> Let me show you what, a, what problems you have with uh, accepting uniformity to guide your thinking of past events. If you've ever changed oil in a car or seen it changed, you pull a little plug out in the bottom of the oil pan and boosh, the oil uh, pours into the pan below. Well, let's say you've never seen that and, and you come along an hour later and you've got a full pan of oil and now it's dropping out of the car at a rate of one drop every hour and a half. Well, based on uniformity, you might look at the size of the pan and the amount of oil and say, gee, it took a thousand years to fill that pan with oil. But you'd be absolutely wrong. When you, you base your your findings of past non-observed events on the belief in uniform processes, your answers can be way, way off, totally erroneous to the actual facts. So in 2 Peter 3, we're told the scoffers are going to be willingly ignorant, willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. In 2 Peter 3, we're told that scoffers in the last days are going to claim uniform processes and deny the global flood. Well, why would you care about the global flood? Well, the secular humanistic worldview and secular geology today is based on two beliefs. Uniform processes, the present rates are the key to the past, and no global flood, just as the Bible said would happen in the last days. So they look at those strata layers and, and they teach students that the rock layers that make up the majority of the crust of the earth formed at today's rate over millions of years of time. So we call this the geologic time scale today. So the belief in long ages of death provides the foundation today for Darwinism. It's a fruit coming off the old earth trees. It's the foundation for naturalism, humanism, atheism, and Gnosticism, and the compromised positions like theistic evolution, progressive creation, etc. And again, I used to be a, a theistic evolutionist. I'm not attacking any such person. I'm here to help you just as somebody helped me. I had never considered the death before Adam issue and a lot of other issues that we'll discuss um, today. So pillar number one for old earth beliefs is the belief, as the Bible foretold, that there was never a global flood. Again, they'll come in the last day scoffers willingly ignorant that the world it was being overflowed with water perished. Well, that leads us to pillar number two, and where the old earth beliefs, the modern old earth beliefs, are really a birth from. And that's the geologic column or geologic time scale. Again, now this was, let me back up, this was invented uh, actually just barely 200 years ago, and they made a drawing of 12 primary layers, and they assigned fossils to each of the layers, including index fossils, which supposedly went extinct while that layer was forming. So they wouldn't be found in the layers above because they had gone extinct already. The index fossils are a key to the old earth dating methods. But overall, the column is based on beliefs in uniformity and no global flood. So again, invented in the early 1800s, the 12 primary layers, they assigned names to each layer, gave each of the layers ages based on beliefs in uniformity and the index fossils. In fact, this textbook tells kids on page 306, we date the rock layer by the fossils, the index fossils found in it. Well, okay, fair enough. But where do they get the age for the index fossil? Where well, it says on page 307, we date the index fossils by the rock layer they're in. So they're, they're dating the rock layer by the fossils in it, and the fossils in it by the rock layer they're in. It's a total circular argument based on the geologic column. For instance, lobe fin fish were index fossils for rock anywhere from 30 million up to 325 million years old. So a layer found with the lobe fin uh, fish in it were dated up to 325 million years old. A lot of problems with this. Uh, number one, the lobe fin fish has been found alive in several of today's oceans, not extinct up to 325 million years. So, you know, I said earlier, there's two ways to look at all the evidence. We all have the same evidence. 
So I look at that uh, picture of that scuba diver with the fish and I say, hey, that refutes the geologic column as a dating method. But you could look at the exact same picture. Remember, there's two ways to interpret the evidence. And you could say, no, it just proves that scuba diver is 325 million years old. Uh, you can choose for yourself which you want to believe. But their index fossils have been showing up alive today by the dozens. And they have become an embarrassment to the geologic column or time scale, which is the foundation of the old earth dating methods. In fact, they've had to come up with a scientific classification for the living index fossils. They now call them Lazarus Taxon because they have risen from the dead. But they never were dead. They never were extinct. We just had not recognized them yet. And this undermines the geologic column or time scale. But realize it's this column, this time scale, that serves as the foundation for Darwinism, humanism, modern atheism, etc. Now, there's a lot of argument about this, but I'm going to state it plainly because in 20 years, I've never seen anyone overcome this. It's only found in two places in its entirety in the entire world, with all 12 of the layers in the correct order with the corresponding index fossils, which make up the column. And those two places are in school textbooks and museum displays. I know of no single place where the entire column is found. Now, you would think, in fact, even the, the Old Earth faithful, they only claim it exists in one half of 1% of the Earth's surface. Now, I've looked at several of those places, and they don't have the correct order of fossils, which actually determine if it's the column or not. So I know of nowhere that it actually exists. And if you want to email me someplace where you think it is found, I'd be glad to take a few minutes if you'd send me some links to that and, and check it out. But I know of nowhere that it's ever been found. I've had some secular geologists standing with me at the canyon and, and point at the canyon and say the column's right there. But actually there's only, not all of the, the main layers are there. The Mesozoic and Cenozoic layers are not there. So at the canyon, they do not have the geologic column. And also be careful when you're talking about the geologic column. It's any time you put two layers on top of each other, you have a geologic column. But the geologic column, the time scale from which the old earth beliefs are birthed, are a different issue altogether. So make sure that they're talking about the geologic column or time scale, not just a couple of random layers on top of one another. Uh, just an example of more of the problems they have. Bacteria were found in, in salt crystals that, according to the geologic column, are 250 million years old, but the bacteria were still alive. That doesn't seem to support the 250 million year time frame. No wonder Jesus said, take heed that no man deceives you. Uh, pillar number, another one of the pillars of old earth beliefs, because I'm not going through these necessarily in the order of my, my top 10 beliefs of old earth uh, dating methods. But uh, another one of the pillars are the radiometric dating techniques. This textbook tells kids that these methods certify that planet Earth is more than 4 billion years old. Let's just take a quick look at carbon dating as an example. It's one of the more popular of the isotope dating methods. And uh, during the process of photosynthesis, so let me back up, uh, cosmic rays enter the atmosphere and carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere. And that's what's measured in carbon dating. But during the process of photosynthesis, plants breathe in CO2 that contain trace amounts of that carbon-14. Animals get carbon-14 in them from eating the plants or from breathing. And we all have trace amounts of carbon-14 in us. Now, there's, there's argument in science over how long the carbon-14 uh, will be there. But I think the majority of opinion is it would be gone in less than 80,000 years in measurable amounts. I've heard as much as 100,000 years. Let's say 100,000 years just to blunt any arguments. But carbon-14 decays away. So once an animal uh, dies, it stops eating and breathing. Or at least, that, well, that's always been my observation. So they're stop, they stop taking in new carbon-14, which is decaying away, and it should be gone in measurable amounts in less than 100,000 years. Now, the less carbon-14 in an item that's found in the ground, the less carbon-14 in it, the older it's going to date because it's decaying away. 
but you can only carbon date something a few thousand years at best. If they say they carbon dated something over 100,000 years, let's say 500,000 years or 2 million years, and I see this in magazines quite often, you realize that they don't know what they're talking about because the carbon-14 would have been gone. Uh, this from the Anthropological Journal of Canada. The troubles of carbon dating are undeniably deep and serious. There are gross discrepancies and accepted dates are actually selected dates. Selected dates? You mean they, they pick a date that they want? Where do they pick a date from? From the man-made geologic column or time scale. The dates have to match the column to be acceptable. Now, personally, I think carbon dating is not particularly accurate. They now try to calibrate it along with tree ring dating, uh, which tells you it's not very accurate to begin with. But I think it at most it's good for about a couple of thousand years. And, and that's mainly because they can calibrate it to known historical events. For instance, if they find a, a cotton shawl and they know that the, uh, the culture that made the shawls existed 18 to 1900 years ago, I guarantee you it's going gonna, it's gonna to carbon date 18 to 1900 years old. They're going to calibrate it to known historical events when they can. This from the American Journal of Science. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible. It wouldn't work if the geologic column had not been there first. Well, what's the man-made geologic column, which doesn't exist, to my knowledge, anywhere in the natural world? Even the old earthers admit it's not there in 99.5% of the Earth's surface. What does that have to do with the radiometric dating techniques? The dating techniques get a range of dates. They want to pick a date that matches the column. For instance, somebody sent me this package of rock salt, and on the label it says, according to the older dating methods, the column, this rock salt is 250 million years old. <laughs> and at the bottom it says it expires in June of this coming year. <laughs> Something's wrong, and I like to point out what that is. So, hey, is there any evidence to support the global flood? Well, we've talked about the stratified layers laid down by water full of uh, billions of uh, dead things that were drowned and buried before they could rot away or get eaten by scavengers. ICR came up with a finding a few years ago on the rate project that they claimed that carbon-14, which should be gone in less than 100,000 years, is still found in organic remains throughout the, uh, the layers of the earth, the, the fossil bearing layers. Well, this would indicate they're less than 100,000 years old. And they also found that the range of amount of carbon-14 was the same from the top layer all the way through to the bottom of the, uh, of the Cambrian layer. Well, this would indicate they were all formed in the same event. Now, I want to tell you what, what I've heard in opposition to that, because I like to you know, give both sides where we can. The other side only gives their uh, side, which really is indoctrination, not education. But the, uh, the opposing argument to that is the carbon-14 has been found because of contamination. They say that the items in the air and the layers were contaminated with the same range of amount of carbon-14. Well, okay, that's, that's fair enough, but that poses a huge problem for the radiometric dating techniques, which are based on several assumptions or wild guesses, if you will, and one of the main assumptions, wild guesses with regarding to all the radioisotope dating methods, is that there was never any contamination. If they're admitting contamination here, then that wipes out all the radiometric dating techniques. Either there was contamination or there was not contamination. The radiometric dating techniques, historic science, are looking at today's rate of uh, decomposition of a uh, isotope, uh, radioisotope element, and they're saying it was the item or the rock being dated was never contaminated by the gain or loss of the item, so that the if so that the uh, the dates they're coming up with based on the based on the gradual decomposition of that element give the date of the formation of the rock that they're dating. If there was contamination, then it ruins all isotope dating methods. So that's a big problem for the old earth side. Also, never has natural gas been found, never has a coal layer been found, 
Never has an oil deposit been found that doesn't still contain carbon-14, which should decay away in measurable amounts in less than 100,000 years. That would indicate all those stratified layers that make up the crust of the Earth formed in the last few thousand years. In fact, remains in the various fossil-bearing layers, uh, remains are found with amino acids, uh, proteins, red blood cells, um, even DNA, even dinosaur DNA has now been found, soft tissues and dinosaur bones. Most people are aware of those nowadays. Why isn't that front page news? You know, because dinosaurs are used as one of the five pillars of getting kids to believe in millions of years of death existing before mankind. No wonder in 1 Timothy we're told to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Now, that word science can mean knowledge, avoid false knowledge, false science, being sold as if it were true. Beware of false teachings, basically, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So how has this, and what does this have to do with Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase? Well, the secular world interprets Grand Canyon, again, through the two um, belief systems, the two starting points that are uh, prophesied in, in Scripture in 2 Peter 3. Grand Canyon is basically interpreted through the beliefs in uniformity and no global flood. <clears throat> We're taught Grand Canyon formed over millions of years of time, putting death before Adam. So please realize the study of Grand Canyon has never been about the evidence. It's not about the stratified layers that make up the rock walls. It's not about the big hole in the ground itself because we all have the exact same Grand Canyon to study. The study of Grand Canyon is about the worldview, the philosophical framework through which the evidences get interpreted. We're taught Grand Canyon, number one, the stratified layers, the rock layers, and the canyon itself both formed over millions and millions of years of time. That is taught as if it were science. That's historical science based on massive amounts of bias, not on the evidence. So a key question is, how long did the stratified layers take to form? And how did the canyon form? And how long did it take to form? Well, first of all, there are many evidences at Grand Canyon that the strata were laid down quickly. Uh, for instance, there are no time gaps between the layers. In fact, this from Geology Illustrated, there is no evidence of prolonged weathering or erosion at the canyon. Time gaps. All the layers are laid down horizontally, one right on top of the other with nice, nice straight contact points. There are no time gaps like uh, weather from uh, rain erosion or snow melt erosion, etc. cetera. Um, no uh, marks in the layers where water runoff uh, dug small gullies in the layer before the next layer formed and would have filled in those, uh, those areas. And no acid le leaching from rocks, etc. No plant growth between them. Those would all be time gaps. The layers at Grand Canyon were laid down one right on top of the other. Uh, Robert Gentry had an interesting discovery on the Colorado Plateau through which Grand Canyon cuts. Microscopic spheres of polonium-210 form radio halos that last up to two years. Now, let me back up and explain that a little bit better. These are microscopic elements, these polonium halos. Uh, when polonium first forms, it gives off a burst of energy, kind of like a big firework going off in the sky. Well, that burst of energy will stay there for about up to two years, one and a half to two years. And if it's in a, a log that petrifies within that two year period of time, it'll catch this ball of energy. When that ball is cut in half, it looks like the picture in front of you right now. You can see the rings of energy. They call those radio halos. So these have been found in three different layers on the Colorado Plateau. The uh, Eocene, Jurassic, and Triassic layers have these polonium halos where the polonium formed a ball and then the layer above was laid down and squished the layer. You see that dark 
uh, um, elongated, looks like a football in the center. That was the round circle it formed, and the layer above was laid down and squished it. But after that event took place, it started forming the round uh, circle yet again. And what that shows is that it was squished while still forming. And once that event took place, the layer above had been laid down. It started making the round um, radio halos yet again, proving those three layers were not laid down over a 250 million year period of time, like we're taught in secular textbooks, but all three layers had to form in less than two years, like during the year-long global flood. Uh, the Coconino sandstone is the third layer down, if you stand on the rim of Grand Canyon, it's that big whitish band that looks like a ring around the bathtub. It goes all the way around the canyon. That arrow is pointing uh, to the Coconino sandstone on the north wall of Grand Canyon. Now, secular geology teaches that this layer formed in dry deserts over, you guessed it, millions and millions of years of time. In fact, this has been for the last hundred years one of the biggest proofs of old earth beliefs uh, promoted through Grand Canyon. But there's a lot of different problems with the Coconino sandstone and old earth beliefs. The Coconino is famous for its cross bedded sand dunes. So the way that this, these cross beds form is sand dunes can form either in dry deserts, be moved along by wind, or underwater and the grains are moved along by water. Well, a cross bedded sandstone forms as the sand dune forms, the sand falls over the edge and forms a cross bedded sandstone. So these angles of inclination are of interest here because the, um, and this is not 100% accurate, but I would say it's in the 80% range accurate. The angle of slope implies whether or not the dunes formed or not uh, underwater or in wind. Generally in dry deserts, the angle of inclination of that cross bed is above 26 degrees if it formed in dry deserts and less than 24 degrees if it formed underwater. The angle of inclination in the cross beds of the Coconino average about 22 degrees, which indicate they formed underwater. Now that all by itself is not 100% conclusive proof that they formed underwater, but it's very strong proof. But what's even better proof are the uh, angled uh, footprints found in those cross beds. Footprints are found, and these are generally uh, regarded as some sort of a amphibian, um, are found in those cross beds only going uphill. And they're found by the millions. They're either going uphill or at an angle uphill. They're never going downhill, always uphill. Why is that? Well, that would indicate water deposits because the critter got washed over the forming sand dune and deposited at the base of the cross bed. And the only way for that critter to get out of that water was to go uphill. He got to the top, washed away as the sand buried his and preserved his trackways for the fossilized trackways we see today. And the poor little guy kept going up, got washed down, up, going washed down, leaving trackway after trackway till he was eventually carried off and drowned in those flood waters. The grains of sand also indicate water deposition of the Coconino. Uh, grains that form in dry deserts usually tumble along, and the grains of sand looked at under a microscope are generally round. When they form underwater, they tend to form a lot quicker and not tumbling around, and they're usually very angular. Well, if you look at the, the, ang uh, the grains of sand of the Coconino sandstone under a microscope, you're going to find that they're very angular again, supporting that they formed underwater, not in dry deserts. Uh, that picture, by the way, you might be able to, if you can see it, I don't know if you can see it well enough, but you've got the, uh, the, the Bright Angel Trail dropping down into Indian Gardens, one of the more popular trails at Grand Canyon. But the trackways go uphill, indicating water deposition. You know, at Grand Canyon, when I take people to the rim, I can point out what I consider to be creation rock at the rim, you can look down into the gorge and you will see the lowest layer with the stratification in them that were laid down by moving water is that cliff, just um, that top arrow just to the left 
of the of the arrow you see that dark cliff and that is the tapit sandstone now it's the lowest of the uh, stratified layers at grand canyon now it sits on non-stratified igneous and metamorphic rocks mostly schists and granites that form what they call the foundational or, or the base basement rock at grand canyon well those non-stratified rock layers are in my humble opinion original creation rock, probably covered by about two miles of sediments prior to the global flood. The flood waters erupted as the fountains of the deep erupted. And over the first 150 days of that global flood, they were eroding those sediments and eroding them and eroding them. Finally, after 150 days, the fountains stopped spewing forth the scalding hot waters. And they started now redepositing these layers that have been rolling around with the waters and being stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. And now they redeposit those sediments stratified so you get all the shale, all the mudstone, all the limestone layers, et cetera. Uh, and at Grand Canyon, you can see where the non-stratified rock meets the stratified layers. And at that point, that's where I contend that creation and judgment are seen in the bottom of Grand Canyon. In fact, where those two layers meet, where the Tapit sandstone sits on the non-stratified schists and granites is geologically called the Great Unconformity. Now, this is where the flood layers, I believe, meet the creation rock. But even secular geology claims that they're missing 1.2 billion years of layers that are supposed to exist between those non-stratified layer, uh, excuse me, non-stratified rock and the Tapit sandstone, they're missing 1.2 billion years of layers there. They call it the great unconformity. I call it the great inconsistency. And if you go to Grand Canyon, you can go down one of the trails. When I used to lead raft trips through the canyon, I, there were a couple of places you could do this right along the river where you can actually put your thumb on the non-stratified uh, creation rock and your your fingers on the first of the judgment layers, literally where creation and judgment physically meet right there in Grand Canyon. And there are some other uh, places around the U.S. that I know of where the great unconformity is uh, is shown. It's exposed where creation and judgment rock meet. But Grand Canyon strata testify to God's global flood judgment. And remember, Darwinism, naturalism, and humanism are all based on those beliefs. Those layers form slowly over millions or billions of years of time. So they must deny the global flood because a global flood would explain how they form quickly, wiping out not only the millions of years beliefs that put death before Adam, but it would also destroy Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, modern atheism, agnosticism, etc and bring people to the one conclusion which is that god's word is true word for word and cover to cover and that's why we need to share this and get this out with people because belief in the age of the earth comes down to how you believe the rock layers formed and even if you believe in old earth beliefs and you have never given the formation of the layers a second thought you're accepting the beliefs of those who believe they form slowly, not quickly, during a global flood. So how did Grand Canyon form? Well, we're told, of course, that it formed over millions of years as the Colorado River carved it out slowly at today's uh, rate of erosion, uniformity. Well, let me ask you a question. I get this question from scoffers and skeptics. I also get it from well-meaning people. I think it's a, a very important question. And that question is this. If rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years of time, and if the earth is billions of years old, well, why aren't there millions of Grand Canyons everywhere? I mean, every river, gully, stream, and creek should be in its own Grand Canyon by now if indeed the earth was millions and billions of years old. So why aren't there Grand Canyons everywhere? Well, first of all, Grand Canyon formed due to a series of very unique circumstances. There I am with a group on the edge of Grand Canyon. I've, I've been leading tours to Grand Canyon oh, for about 19 years now. Uh, before the, the pandemic, I was uh, leading up to 1,000 people a year to the canyon. 
usually in groups of about 50. And there I am with a school group on the edge of the canyon. Right behind my head there, that butte, is some of the most awesome proof of the global flood anywhere in the world. That's called Cedar Mountain or Cedar Butte. I'll explain that here in just a moment. But they both support Cedar Butte and Red Butte give solid support to the global flood. Now, these are two sister buttes. Uh, Red Butte is found oh, about seven or eight miles south of Tucson, where the Grand Canyon IMAX is. Most people that go to the South Rim drive right by Red Butte, some of the most awesome proof of the flood in the world, but they don't, don't give it a second thought, and they go to the canyon where they're told the area formed over millions of years of time. Uh, Cedar Butte is over by Desert Viewpoint. It's actually officially called Cedar Mountain, Cedar Mountain, Cedar Butte, and Red Butte. Uh, Tucson, the name translates land of the isolated buttes, referring to these two buttes. They stand 900 feet tall above the rim of the canyon. If you look at the picture on, on the left of Cedar Butte, you see the rim of Grand Canyon. You see Cedar Butte is actually 900 feet excuse me, above the canyon. It's made of the 600-foot Moenkopi layer and the 300-foot Chin Li layer, which both sit on top of the Kaibab limestone, which makes up the rim of Grand Canyon and makes up the top layer of the Colorado Plateau. So the Moenkopi and the Chin Li, those 900 feet of, of layers, used to exist over the entire region, but has been uh, removed by a massive erosional event but God in his divine wisdom, knowing Grand Canyon would be one of the five pillars of old earth beliefs, left two remnants at both of the entrance points, the eastern entrance to the south rim and the southern entrance of the south rim. He left two undeniable proofs of flooding that had to be on a global scale right there. So we'd be without excuse. So what in the world? How, what removed 900 feet of layers? Well, actually, if we go back to this uh, slide with Cedar Butte and Red Butte, the 900 feet are just the start. There used to exist almost 10,000 feet of rock layers above where today's rim stands. In other words, there used to be almost two miles of rock layers on top of the Kaibab limestone that makes up the rim of Grand Canyon. Cedar Butte and Red Butte are just remnants of about one-tenth of what is missing. When I stand on the edge of the canyon with people, I tell them, bracket Cedar Butte with your thumb and your, your index finger, and now add nine times that much on top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's how much rock layer has been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. It used to exist right on top of where we're standing at the edge of the canyon. So what we think happened was continental drift took place toward the end of the flood quickly, not slowly and uniformly at today's rate. Happened fairly quickly. Uh, late flood waters eroded uh, what is now the uh, southwestern United States, removing up to up to two miles of rock layers from the southwestern region in the Colorado Plateau, leaving behind in southern Utah and northern Arizona what is geologically called the Grand Staircase. So in this depiction from National uh, uh, Geologic Society, uh, I believe, my, I can't see the, uh, the uh, reference at the bottom here, but um, I believe that's where it's from. But you've got Grand Canyon depicted on the left. Now, it's not a real good depiction of the canyon, but you notice it cuts through that uplifted area. That's the Kaibab Upwork. Grand Canyon does not cut a mile deep into the plain. No, the area was uplifted. Grand Canyon cuts through the upwork. When you're staying on the rim of Grand Canyon, you're on top of the upwork looking at the canyon that cuts through the uplifted uh, layers. But if you go north of Grand Canyon in these pictures, if you look at that, um, and I don't know if you can see this on your screen or not, but that top layer, the Kaibab limestone depicted there in this uh, drawing of the canyon, if you go north, it's subducted, and you'll see it gets buried by up to almost two miles of other rock layers that used to be above that region but have been removed, God leaving uh, red and cedar uh, buttes there at the south rim so that we would know of this massive erosional event. But if you go north, and I, I generally, there's the chocolate cliffs, um, um, 
made up of the Moenkopi mudstones that make up the base of Red and Cedar Buttes. Uh, but if you go north about 100, excuse me, about 65 miles, you're coming to the 2,000 foot tall Vermilion Cliffs. Now, if you climb up on top of those 2,000 foot cliffs and go about 40 miles north, you'll come to um, Zion. And if you climb up on top of those 2,500 foot cliffs and go 40 to 45 miles north, you'll come to the 2,500 foot pink cliffs where we find Bryce. So let's take a quick look at this. Again, there I am at, on the rim of Grand Canyon by Desert View talking to some people with Cedar Butte standing behind me. It's at the uh, southeastern edge of the Grand Canyon, and it's 900 feet above where I'm standing right there on the rim of the canyon. Those layers used to be on top of where we are right there. If you've ever been to Grand Canyon, those layers used to be 900 feet above the rim of the canyon. And again, south of Tucson, you get the 900 foot tall Red Butte. Both are made up of the 600 feet of Moenkopi and the 300 feet of the Chin Li layers. Now, if you go 60 miles north of Grand Canyon at Desert View, you'll come to the Vermilion Cliffs. And the Vermilion Cliffs stand 2,000 uh, feet tall. Um, they're sort of a reddish uh, uh, sandstone made of the Moenovi and the uh, Kayenta formations, if that means anything to you. But they're 2,000 feet tall, roughly. Now, if you were to climb up on top of the Vermilion Cliffs, and by the way, that's where the river raft, I'm at Desert, um, excuse me, um, uh, Lee's Ferry there taking that picture. And uh, that's where the river raft trips are launched through the canyon. On our rim and raft trips that come from Page at the bottom of Glen Canyon, 17 miles downriver around Horseshoe Bend, we get out at Lee's Ferry. As I'm using this area to show you the truth of God's word, because you're you're rafting through these this uh, canyon, which is Glen Canyon and Marble Canyon, and all of a sudden, just before you get to Lee's Ferry, you got these 500 to 2,000 foot cliffs on both sides of you. You emerge from those cliffs, and they're cut like a knife and gone all the way to the sea. So if you climb up on top of the Vermilion Cliffs and go about 45 miles north, you'll start running into the 2,500 foot tall uh, white and gray cliffs through which Zion cuts. So on our Grand Staircase tours, we do the South Rim, the North Rim of Grand Canyon. We spend a couple of nights in Zion and we go to Bryce and the river rafting uh, trip I just mentioned as well. Now, if you climb up on top of the 2,500 foot white and gray cliffs and go about another 40 to 45 miles north, you'll come to the 2,500 foot tall pink cliffs where we find Bryce. And just north of Bryce, uh, you can't, you, well, you can see it in that picture. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, is the Ponsagant Plateau, which basically is the end of the Grand Staircase. But Bryce Canyon, they call it Bryce Canyon, it's actually not a canyon. It's actually at the edge of a plateau where it drops off. It's actually a big sapping structure. Uh, one of the things, in fact, what the secular teachings are at Bryce, you know, these, these neat uh, formations they, they see at Bryce, they call them hoodoos. Well, the way that they say the hoodoos form is over, well, you know, millions of years of time. Water gets into the cracks and freezes and expands and melts and freezes and expands, and that cracks off the rock, leaving behind the hoodoos. Well, one of the things I point out there at the rim of, Grand, of Bryce, excuse me, and I point this out at Grand Canyon as well, is there's no rock debris on the ground. There's virtually no rock debris. Uh, the way that these actually form, if it was over long periods of time, you'd have rocks piled up almost as high as the hoodoos by now, but there's hardly any rock debris because this was a sapping structure. The water came up against the side of this butte, and when the water drained suddenly, they left the hoodoos behind, taking the debris with them. Uh, and you'll see that Bryce is a big amphitheater. Like um, the photo on the right is at uh, Grand Canyon, but you see those big amphitheaters. You ever walk along the edge of a river? A sapping structure, the water gets under the edge, and when it leaves, the, the edge just collapses straight down and makes these little amphitheaters. Well, on a larger scale, you see this at Grand Canyon and certainly uh, at Bryce Canyon. It's a sapping structure. Now, again, if you look down into Bryce, you'll see that the rock debris is pretty well missing. Long ages of crumbling hoodoos would have left piles of rock as almost as high as the hoodoos are today. So what happened? Well, the Bible tells us toward the end of the flood, the waters rushed up by the mountains and into the valleys below. 
we think these waters slosh back and forth, running up against the mountains, then going back into the lower areas, which are forming today's ocean basins. Textbooks correctly teach you can't bend rock. It would snap if you bent it. And yet all around the globe, we find massive geologic compression events where entire mountain ranges, hundreds of feet of finely stratified rock layers laid down by water have been squished together like an accordion with up to 160 deg degree bends in the rock, but the rock's not broken. Now, how do you bend rock 160 degrees without snapping it? Now, the sacral excuse that I've been given is that entire area was subducted several miles below the surface to where they were superheated. And when they were burnt back up to the surface, the molten rock was then folded, came to the surface, and it's cooled. And that's how you bend it without breaking it. Well, there's a problem with that. If you superheat sedimentary rock, it'll metamorphose and would be metamorphic rock today. But there's still sedimentary rock. So the subduction and superheating doesn't fit the evidence. But toward the end of the flood, when the mountains arose and the valley sank down and any geologic or continental drift took place, when they stopped, you would have had folding events where the layers folded without breaking the rock layers. Now, toward the end of the global flood, the mountains arose and the valley sank down and the water Assuaged. It sloshed up by the mountains and went back into the low areas, and they sloshed back and forth for a couple of months, which I'm going to imagine is one of the many reasons Noah and the animals stayed on the ark even for a couple of months after it had landed on the mountains of Ararat. Now, this is a satellite photo of Grand Canyon. Uh, we're looking down at the canyon. The north rim is over 8,500 feet in elevation, but the river enters the canyon at about 2,800 feet elevation. Uh, well over a mile below, um, the rim is well over a mile above where the river enters the canyon. And water doesn't flow uphill. So they've got a problem there. They taught the ancient river theory for about 100 years that the upwork formed at the exact same rate that the water was cutting through it. That's been debunked now for about 60 years. And they finally stopped teaching it, I think, about 30 years ago or so. But most people today still uh, think of the ancient river theory because that's what most people were taught when they were kids. Then they came up with the precocious gully or stream capture theory where near Kanab Creek, uh, there was an event where the, the uh, waters, uh, rain flow and stuff were slowly eroding from the southeast uh, southeastern edge and the Colorado River was carving in from the north and the western edge and then turning off into Kanab Creek. Well, when I used to, to, and eventually they say that the two erosional events met and then the Colorado went on through and were her forms today, leaving behind Grand Canyon. Well, when I used to, to lead raft trips through the canyon there at Kanab Creek, it's a spectacular straight stretch of the river where the rock wall on river left is literally 700 feet straight up for about a three mile stretch. And right in the middle of that, Kanab Creek turns off where they say the Colorado River was, was turning off before the erosional events met. But it immediately goes into these little uh, meandering loops uh, that couldn't have been cutting those 700 foot cliffs on one side raging through there and then turn it into meandering loops. That doesn't make any sense. Also, there's no spot where you can show where the two met. It's just one straight length of, of uh, 700 foot tall wall. The uh, stream capture theory doesn't make any sense uh, in my humble opinion. And uh, secular geologists, like flood geologists, by the way, are both scrambling to try to, to uh, come up with answers to the various problems they, they have with geology, especially at Grand Canyon. I'll be the first to admit I, I, I put, took, I led a, uh, a nine-day river raft trip through the canyon a few years ago with 11 geologists. And the one thing I came away with after that was that they don't agree on anything. And the reason for that, and it's, it's nothing, no, no knock against them, but it's a historical science. You're trying to take things that you can observe today and then extrapolate those into the past. And it's very difficult to get any one theory to match. So I never try to sell any particular theory because I understand they've all got challenges and people are working hard to try to, to work those out. 
But this again is a uh, satellite photo of Grand Canyon. The white is snow. It's, it's on the upwarp that was uplifted to around 3,500 feet above the plain. So this, the, the upwarp is covered with snow, whereas the lower elevations on the plain are not. But as you can see, Grand Canyon cuts through the uplifted area. It doesn't cut necessarily into the plain. It cuts through the upwarp. That's what makes Grand Canyon spectacular. So the area was uplifted. You had the late flood waters removed up to two miles of rock layers, leaving behind and, strata and scraping it down to the Kaibab limestone. That if you've been to northern Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona sits on the Kaibab limestone. The rim of the canyon is the Kaibab limestone. But the Kaibab limestone and the Kaibab plateau was uplifted in what's called the Kaibab upwarp which is a north-south trending monocline, flexing the plateau up to about 3,500 feet above the plain. The canyon cuts through that upwarp. In fact, if you go into the Grand Canyon, you probably have to do this on a raft trip, you'll find lots of folded sedimentary layers laid down by water, like um, in the upper left is the Carbon Creek Fold, that's the Monument Fold on the right, I'm at a little bit of uh, Bright Angel Shale at Whitmore Wash that's folded in the lower left corner. But these are folded in 90 degree folds, yet the rock was not broken, indicating they were still muds toward the end of the flood when the mountains arose and the valley sank down following the massive erosional event above it. So what we think happened was toward the end of the flood when the mountains arose, the Rocky Mountains in in Colorado, the Wasash Mountains of, of Utah and the Sierra Madres running through California were uplifted uh, in a north-south trending direction. Now, this diverted late floodwater south, and they went through what is now the scab lands of southern Utah and northern Arizona, including the Grand Canyon region, emptying out toward the Gulf of California. Grand Canyon's formation, well, there are, again, several developing theories, and I try not to set on any one theory. I, I'm not trying to sell any particular theory. I'm standing up for God's word, saying even if we don't know exactly how things took place, just like the secular scientists don't know, we, we have good scientists working on it, but I'm not trying to sell any particular person's theory. I'm just trying to let you know that you can trust God's word, word for word and cover to cover. We theorize that the canyon was formed as late flood waters form a channeling event. Now the uh, two miles of sediments had just been removed. The mountains and the Kaibab upwarp formed quickly. And as these waters started to dissipate, they started to channel and they cut through the Kaibab upwarp, leaving behind Grand Canyon in a matter of days. Marble Canyon channels in from the north whereas the Little Colorado River Canyon channels in from the northeast. Now, these two meet at the base of the Kaibab upwarp at the start of the official start of Grand Canyon and cut through that upwarp in a matter of days, not slowly, over never seen millions of years of time. And you need to picture this. The raging waters were carrying millions of tons of, of sand grains gravel and rock and boulders up to 200,000 pound boulders ripping through that upwarp at about 120 miles per hour. It was like a giant belt sander ripping through the upwarp and spreading the missing 900 cubic miles of sediments widely so they're difficult to identify today. I've been told by geologists they think some are outside of Phoenix, some are over in San Diego County, but they're spread wide. They're not along the edge of the Colorado River or down in the Gulf because the Colorado River had nothing to do with the formation of the major portions of the canyon. It's only formed the slow meandering loops you see in the bottom of the canyon today over the last 4,000 to 4,500 years since the river entered the canyon. Uh, raging waters lead to a lot of uh, massive problems. I'll just mention one, cavitation bubbles. Cavitation bubbles implode at about almost a half a million pounds per square inch. So at um, Glen Canyon, uh, um, north of, or by Page, Arizona, 
about 17 miles above Lee's Ferry, where the river rat trips start. Back in 1983, they had a, a great snow year and massive runoff. And in the spring, they had lots of rain and all this water was rushing into Lake Powell to where the water came within a few feet of the top of the dam. If water would go over the dam, it would cause that dam to collapse catastrophically and it would have wiped out Lake Mead, uh, the, the dams all down river, including Hoover Dam and all of the cities along the Colorado River. So they started opening up all the spillways to let as much water out of the lake as possible. And they, th fortunately, this happened during the middle of the day so they could see what was going on. The dam started to shake. The engineers went out and peered over the edge of the dam and the spillway on river left was shooting water about 200 yards down river. It was coming out with such pressure, but the water had turned red. A cavitation event had taken place. They shut down the spillway immediately and went inside to see what had happened. This cavitation event, these tiny bubbles imploding at almost a half a million pounds per square inch had eaten through the three foot steel reinforced concrete walls of that spillway and left a hole 40 feet deep, 40 feet wide, and 150 feet long in a matter of minutes. If this had taken place at night, they might not have known what had happened and they would have lost that entire dam system and all the cities along the Colorado River in Arizona and Southern California. Geologists now think, and this comes from uh, World News and uh, National Geographic for Kids, they stated, geologists now think the Grand Canyon grew in quick spurts from massive flooding over 750,000 years. They've got to hang on to some time. It's the foundation of everything they believe in. But if you go to Grand Canyon, the vertical canyon walls testify of rapid formation, not slow, gradual formation. Also, the lack of rock debris, as I pointed out at Bryce, also exists in the main chasm at Grand Canyon. You see, rock walls collapse over time, and if it had stood there for millions of years, as they claim, it should be almost filled up with rock debris by, by now. But if you go to the canyon and look into the main uh, chasm around the major viewpoints, you'll see there's hardly any rock debris, which indicates that not only did it form rapidly, but it formed relatively recently as well. This textbook asks kids, challenge your thinking. Grand Canyon shows wide meandering loops of an old youthful or, or, or of an old mature river, but then it shows straight up and down steep walls of a very fast moving youthful river. How might this conflict be explained? Well, it doesn't fit with the old earth beliefs. The only way I can explain that viably is it took a very special set of circumstances to form Grand Canyon. Toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, late floodwaters removed almost two miles of layers from above today's rim of the canyon. As the mountains arose and the valley sank down, the Kaibab upwarp formed, late floodwaters eroded through, channeled through the upwarp, leaving behind Grand Canyon with the straight up and down walls. The Colorado River then entered the already formed canyon and cut the slow meandering loops since its uh, introduction to the canyon about 4,000 or so years ago. Polished river rock is another thing I used to show people on our, our raft trips. Water running over rocks will polish the rocks. I'm sure you've all seen polished river rock before. Now, Grand Canyon, I used to ask some of the, the old earth guides that we had, do you guys really believe the, the river carved this slowly over millions of years of time? And they would say yes. And I would say, well, what's that shiny rock over there? And they say, that, that's river rock. The water running over the rock over long periods of time leaves the polished river rock behind. And I would ask them, well, answer this. How come the polished river rock in the bottom of Grand Canyon only goes up about 15 to 20 feet above the river? And then thousands of feet from there up, it's not polished. If the, if the river had carved out the canyon slowly, it would be polished from the top slowly all the way down to the bottom. No, the canyon formed quickly. The river entered the already formed canyon, leaving polished river rock only in the very lowest stretches above the river. My friends, Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase are monuments to God's global flood judgment. And 
Honestly, the uh, geologic periods are very important to have a starting point for scientific investigation. But the only real difference in the secular um, geologic time frame and the biblical time frame is what event laid down those layers and how long did it take for those layers to form? The biblical time frame, looking at a global flood, fits the evidence like a hand in a glove, fits better than the old earth beliefs do when you look at all of the evidences. There's some of the evidence that really only fit a biblical interpretation. In fact, this Nobel Prize winning scientist stated, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted if I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. There is no reason not to read God's word and believe God's word, word for word and cover to cover. So why do secularists and humanists continue to promote millions and billions of years of time at the Grand Canyon? Well, because millions of years of time is the foundation of Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, atheism, agnosticism, etc. And if there was a global flood, it would explain how those layers form quickly destroying not only the old earth beliefs, but all of those beliefs I've just named and many more as well. Millions and billions of years of time are the foundations for these groups. That's why the global flood is the linchpin in the war of worldviews. And they don't de deny the global flood because of a lack of evidence. They deny the global flood because it would destroy their belief system. So the real question is, did death exist before Adam? Or did God judge man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven? Can we read God's word and believe God's word? I say, yes, we can. From Ephesians, we're told, Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Come and join us on some of our rim and raft trips. We've got several, uh, usually between May and September. Uh, they're set months in advance. I, I don't do daily tours. So join one of our trips. A lot of them are already sold out this year, but I think there are a couple of rim and raft trips and one grand staircase trip that still have openings. They are awesome and fun Christian tours. My book, Cost, cover, stands for Creation, Original Sin, Separation, and the Cross, Our Need for Redemption. And it covers the top 10 old earth beliefs, the top 10 evil fruit of these beliefs, the top 10 Darwinian teachings, the top 10 proofs of creation in the flood. Study guides go with it. Check that out on our site, which is creationministries.org. And I hope this information will be a blessing uh, to you all. Thank you for your time. Wow, Russ, I got to say that was a fantastic presentation. So Thank much you. great information. An hour and a half really flies by. And I'm not the only one saying this, but I'm going to definitely be rewatching this uh, later just to catch every single uh, great point. Uh, tons of great feedback from the chat. Russ, we've had a great chat. Lots of compliments. And thank you so much for that important and, in my opinion, irrefutable uh, presentation. Well, thank you, Donnie. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We've only got about 10 hours worth of questions, uh, Russ. So I yeah. hope you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> taking I'm not, I'm not like George, George is going to handle those for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 concur, I concur with those sentiments uh, there, Donnie. I agree that uh, that was a massive presentation, which, which I'm going to add to, and uh, I'm going to share my screen now. I'm not going to let Russ have all the glory. But <laughs> Actually, uh, that's I, what I was going to say, George. Russ, you just got done speaking for about an hour and a half straight massive presentation tons of great information so we're going to give you a, a roughly two minute break and we're going to hand it over to george to uh well, that sounds good to me <laughs> sit back and relax well russ yeah well okay i'm gonna share i'm gonna share my screen sure and can you see that yes okay going on from what uh, russ was saying about um, Eighty-two percent of the modern science has um, been the result of actual creationists. Th this is a pie chart of um, Nobel prizes for the past hundred years, and you'll see Christians at sixty-five point four and Jewish at twenty-one point one. That that adds up to eighty-six point five 
percent of all Nobel prizes were awarded to um, to creationists. And you'll see the atheists, agnostics, and free thinkers there are around ten percent. And most of those, by the way, were for um, um, prizes on uh, literature, I believe. And now, just just to go on to the diamonds issue, uh, Russ mentioned contamination. I'd like to say is how do you contaminate a diamond? We've looked at this uh, issue about contamination, especially diamonds. If uh, people know uh, the carbon structure of the diamonds is so tightly packed that nothing can get into it except light and possibly radiation. So one of the rescue devices that uh, secular scientists have proposed is the carbon-14 in the diamonds was a result of um, uh, radiation from nearby uranium converting the free nitrogen in the diamond into C14. But that's been dispelled because, uh, well, if uranium, for example, has a half-life of uh, 4.5 billion years, while uh, C14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. So if you do the maths, the um, the carbon-14 is decaying probably about 300,000 times faster than, uh, than the actual uranium can make it. So that's a pretty poor rescue device, by the way. But just to um, add to, uh, I think, the radio halos, uh, you know, they talk. They, there's there's a lot being said about the heat problem. I mean, those radio halos, if there was a excessive heat problem, would not exist. Same with the fissures; they would have annealed, and there wouldn't have been any evidence of that at all. So, that's one one area. Not only do, does it prove an accelerated heat decay, but uh, but also that there wasn't much of uh, heat that. Um, would have uh, kept those radio halos alive. Now, um, Russ mentioned about the river deltas. Oh, oh, sorry, the actual erosion at the Grand Canyon. I'll, I'll just cite a, you know, the major rivers in the world, like the Nile and the Amazon, they have very large deltas. And Russ pointed out that um, in the case of the Grand Canyon, I think there were about 900. I read somewhere that it was a thousand cubic miles of erosion, but there's there's only a, a very small delta. I think it's about one percent of that sediment is contained in the delta. That's another proof that that erosion happened quickly, and you'll probably find a lot of that material is sitting in in the ba in the ocean basin somewhere. Uh, now. Uh, with the um, Grand Canyon, uh, I'm going to add to, to to Russ's arguments here. You'll you'll notice the bottom la there is the Tapete Sandstone just above the uh, Great Nonconformity, as it's known. Now, um, Dr. Snelling and AIG have done some uh, research on this specifically. Uh, before actually, before I go into that. Russ mentioned about the wind deposited um, layers of uh, the Coconino. That's a recumbent fall there. I keep using this recumbent falls can't form in a wind situation. Sorry, that's that's got to be um, a water event, a watery event with uh, lateral movement. Okay, er erosion. Erosion. It, um, Russ also mentioned the sharp edges of the of the um, sides of the canyon. Here's something that I found uh, with regards to lightning. And lightning, if most people aren't aware, is, is a, a huge contributor to erosion and weathering. As you can see there in the um, Grand Canyon, you have 15,000 strikes per, per annum, I think, and they're mostly prevalent along the rim of the canyon. So as Russ mentioned, where's all that loose matter that should be at the base of that canyon if the canyon's 40 to 70 million years old, it doesn't work. So going going back to the Tapete Sandstone and uh, Dr. Snelling from AIG, what they wanted to do was they wanted to collect some samples of rocks, specifically in this region where you see these 90 degree bends in the in the sandstone to see whether there's evidence for um, you know metamorphosis because their their ex their explanation is that occurred deep underground at high pressures and high heat uh, and that's and then it uplifted over time 
So what um, Dr. Snelling had done was approach the um, Grand Canyon National Committee or something like that. I think they call themselves that to get a permit to do the uh, to these to, to these investigations. And to his surprise, though, though his requests for a permit were knocked back. Uh, I'll cut a long story short. They actually took took the um, committee to court, and they finally got their um, their permit. They took their samples, and guess what, guys? There is absolutely no evidence of meta, of a metamorphic process, like Russ was saying. Uh, heat heat will produce a metamorphic process, and will leave some kind of evidence. Sorry, no evidence of that in the case of these these bends in the Tapete sandstone. Okay, uh, the, if you want to read about it, you can you can find it in the Answers Research General, Journal. Uh, effectively, they say none of the evidence supports the evolutionary idea that the folding occurred 450 million years after the sandstone was cemented. Instead. It is overwhelmingly consistent with the sand layers being deposited rapidly at the beginning of the global flood cataclysm year. The bending of the still wet soft layers occurred only months later at the end of the flood year when the plateau was uplifted. The sand layers cemented to, sand, to, to sandstone as they dried out at the end of of and after the flood. Furthermore, no evidence points to any metamorphic changes in the sandstone or its mineral grains, either in the folds or in the sample miles away from the folds. So there's pretty uh, good uh, refuting evidence there on the um, secular explanation of those folds, guys. And mm -hmm. and uh, just if, if you're not aware, uh, John Mackay is, is a personal friend of mine. He has a uh, creation conversations every Friday for the Northern Hemisphere guys and uh, early Saturday morning for us Aussie guys. But what he presented uh, in his last um, uh, conversation um, to our conversation was some um, flume experiments that he's done uh, over time. And what what he, what he's actually saying here is um, many of, many of the flume experiments that we see today are done at a constant velocity, okay? So what John did was he actually varied the velocity. He changed the velocity of, of uh, the flows in the flume. And this is this is what he actually produced. These, these are the photo, these are actual photos taken from the side of the flume. That's a perspex um, uh, boundary there, by the way. So you can actually see the layering. And what, what he's found, and no surprise to us is the la the layering that occurs is actually in the direction of 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 the of the flow or or um, in ho in a horizontal direction to the flow, and um, these are some of the things that he that he found by changing the velocity. You, you're going to start to see these these bent layers at the base as I keep going through these other and look at look at that. Do you, do, you, do you see those specific bends in layers purely so it by like changing the sandstones? Yeah, purely by changing the velocity of the uh, of the water and and get a load of this now. Compare that. Now the secular scientists will will or geologists will call that anticlines and synclines. And he, John says these are not due to subsidence of uplift. As you can see there, they can be created in a flume experiment very easily by varying the velocity of the water. And here it is. Here's another picture of it um, clearly clearly showing those bends, the anticlines and the, syn and the synclines. And, and have a look at this. That's a close-up. And this last photo, the bottom, the bottom is a geological cross-sectional map of some of these anticlines and synclines. Compare that to the experiment in the flumes that John had undertaken. Amazingly, <laughs> amazing evidence that it doesn't take millions of years and deep um, a burial uh, with heat to and lateral compression to create them. Sorry, guys, but that's that's me. And, he's, and he says it only took 20 minutes, not millions of years. Uh, his, his very short summary is, 
it's not time that does this, but the process. Mm -hmm. And and looking at his experiments, he's you know this is empirical evidence. He has proven that those folds in the layers can be created through changes in the velocity of the water. And as, as we keep saying, the flood was a catastrophic event. There would have been movement of water backwards and forwards at different different rates, and they would have created that uh, scenario of different velocities and been a perfect, perfectly good explanation for all those different bent layers. So, so if you want to see further further um, evidence of uh, what he's done, you can watch the the actual flume flume experiments yourself. They're only short videos. You can visit uh, the creationresearch.net site and just uh, go to rock layers, and you'll find plenty of material um, that's literature as well as videos that you can watch to to show you that 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 process of la layering and and bending of layers can be achieved through changes in water velocity and not necessarily uh, heat and pressure as secular scientists um, will have you believe. Mm. So I'll, I'd, I'd like to just say I hope, I hope I've added to your arguments, Russ, and, and that's pretty good evidence to support uh, a global event. Hey, George, that, that was excellent. In fact, what you were showing this man did was operational science. Correct, yeah. Which you can test, study, and observe these things forming quickly. Nobody has ever seen any of those things form slowly. That that was that was excellent, absolutely excellent work he's done. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. I thought people would like it. Yeah. Well, you guys make a fantastic team. Uh, there is an extensive amount of information in this uh, one single show, so I appreciate it. I love that. Not a, not not time but a process process um and and there's so many things i could say and add to but you know what we're just going to get into a few of these questions and uh, i want to respect your time as well uh, russ miller so we'll get through a couple of these and uh maybe in the future as well if if we uh have you back on we can we can get to more of them so um george there's a ton of questions here in in the side chat did you want to do the honors of picking out the first one um for russ to engage here what do you think oh there's there's so many i was um especially from god and and gun clinger uh, i think we'll just pick a few of those because they're just uh some of those are fairly fairly basic and we've covered them so many times um it, it'd be silly to go through them again uh one of the ones he says um Question for us: Does he see all these terminal dry lake beds as flood evidence? Uh, well, not necessarily as global floods. Some of those things could be leftovers from uh, the uh, ice age that was a direct result of the global flood, and as it, those layers melted back, and you had the runoff from the glacier melt. So there's there's different. Uh, uh, things that could leave a lot of these things behind that they're not proof. I don't see them anyway as proof of millions and billions of years of time. And that's the key. I appreciate that, Russ. I'll get one of these uh, questions in here, uh, George. This is a criticism or objection that comes up frequently these days, Russ. I'm curious as to your thoughts. The question is those that reject a global flood have made the argument or claim that the existence of limestone refutes a worldwide flood. Their argument is essentially that limestone cannot accumulate during a flood. Is there any validity to this argument? And what are your overall thoughts on that, Russ? Well, I think, number one, that's an excellent question. And I think it's a question that, that needs to have some light shed on it again. Nobody observed the formation of the uh, the limestone. Um, I will I will say this on our river raft trip on our rim and raft trip we go through the um, from Glen Canyon Dam down to Lee's Ferry it's about 17 miles we go around Horseshoe Bend uh, that rim and raft trip is there to show people that we can trust God's word word for word and cover to cover and as we get past Horseshoe Bend, past the halfway point, I have them tie the rafts up. And as we're floating down this two-mile canyon with these towering rock walls on both sides, it's the Navajo sandstone. 
And of course, the secular interpretation of sandstone is, of course, it formed over millions of years in dry desert conditions. Well, like all the other uh, issues that I talked about in the Coconino sandstone, they have the same problems with cross-bedded sandstones, angles of inclination, rounded uh, as a, or, or angular as opposed to rounded sand uh, grains, uh, amphibian tracks, etc. But God left right, <laughs> right above, about 100 feet above the river, there's about a seven foot thick layer of limestone that goes right through this, this, uh, this sandstone. So this limestone, which is a marine deposit, is right through the middle of what they're claiming was a dry desert deposit. And it just destroys their, their interpretation. So, but limestone as a whole, how in the world did we come up with all the, with all the limestone formations? And I think it's a great question. It's one of the questions that I think uh, both the secular and the, and the uh, biblical geologists still um, are trying to figure out. I have my own uh, thought on this that I think that the uh, biblical-based scientists should take into account and look into. I think that, first of all, there is a lot of, of uh, limestone, and I've seen it thrown out that there were massive blooms and plumes of limestone formed because of the hot uh, fountains of the deep during the global flood. And I think that that is viable, that there probably was. But I don't think that there was enough, there could have been enough to uh, explain all the limestone formations and layers around the globe, just like the 500 thick foot thick um, red wall limestone uh, found uh, about halfway down the walls of Grand Canyon. I believe that the limestone, a lot of the limestone formed in the pre-flood world, we had almost 1,650 to 1,700 years, according to the Bible's time frame, from creation before the flood. After Adam's fall and death had entered, you had uh, a lot of these warm, shallow oceans and seas with massive lime formation in and, and lime formations in those seas. So when the fountains of the deep erupted, you already had a lot of that future limestone layer already uh, in place. The, the limestone was torn up and, and once again with all the other sediments that were being eroded during the first 150 days of the flood, they were rolling along in the waters, being separated by grain size, weight, and density, which is why you got all the limestone together to form the red wall limestone, the Torweep limestone, or the Kaibab limestone at Grand Canyon. I think most of that material existed in the pre-flood world and were torn up and then uh, separated by grain size, weight, and density, where they were then laid down in the uh, layers we see toward the latter part of the flood. I think that also somewhat explains why we have all the rock layers. Why did the why did those sedimentary layers all turn into rock, like the sandstone that they formed in dry desert? Why did they form rock? Well, the way we form um, concrete is you put lime into the mix, and when you put water into it and lay it out, it turns to concrete, basically to rock. And I think that bit of lime mixed through all of the different sediments also explain why those layers turned to rock fairly quickly uh, following their deposition during the global flood. But that's my thought on the limestone, as a lot of it was in play prior to the fountains of the deep erupting. So I hope that helps uh, shed some thoughts on the limestone. Can I can I add something to that? Uh, this ahead. is this goes back to operational uh, science for us. Um, some Swedish scientists were looking at uh, solving this uh, carbon dioxide issue of the atmosphere to you know, regarding the climate climate change business. And what they did was they drilled a hole deep into the ground. Uh, I can't remember the depth, but it was considerable depth and pumped the CO2 down into that depth. What they found, to their surprise after a year, a lot of that CO2 turned into limestone. And I, I'm going to propose, like uh, many other um, geologists, um, that limestone can also be a chemical process. Mm. We, 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 we see it forming during volcanic eruptions and uh, there would have been a lot of volcanic activity during the uh, global uh, flood event. And uh, the, other, the other piece of evidence too is, according to secular science, their, their deposition rates of limestone is about one to two centimetres per thousand years. Now, we find lots of fossils in these limestones that are 
so thick that it would take thousands upon thousands of years for them to fossilize. That's that's impossible under their scenario, but it's very easily explained under the flood scenario. That's all I have to add to that. I thought that that's that's some more excellent uh, input, George. I appreciate that. I think all of these issues together explain the limestone without it being a problem. The secular yep. world seems to think it's a huge problem. I don't think it's, it is a problem. And with what you've just added, it to me becomes even less of an issue. And, and, and the and the other the other point too, Russ. I mean, you know about the uh, uh, White Cliffs of Dover in England. I mean, they're eroding. They're eroding. I think, from memory, about six feet per year or something. I mean, if we're talking about millions of years, we shouldn't be seeing any England at all. It should have all eroded away. So that's the other thing. The erosion issue of the limestone is another uh, sort of like a whack, whack over the head for uh, secular geology. Well, gentlemen. Well, like I said, you guys make a fantastic team. So I like that because one of their main objections, there is a, an answer, uh, multiple answers ready uh, to go. I appreciate how thorough that was. Uh, Russ, you are an encyclopedia worth of information. Uh, you and George both. So I appreciate it, uh, brothers. So this one comes in from Douglas Boffy. I appreciate it. I put this one up on a uh, screen, Russ. Uh, in case you wanted to have a look at it with us. But he asks, uh, when I was talking with an evolutionist and held the Little Grand Canyon up as an example of, the Grand, of, of how the Grand Canyon was created, he replied that the Little Grand Canyon um, was straight, whereas the Grand Canyon was not. What does Ross have to say about I, I guess... Yeah. Any thoughts well, I guess on that he's, he's, yeah, he's talking. I'm assuming he's talking about the little Grand Canyon up at Mount St. Helens, which formed in a matter of uh, hours. Um, in fact, Mount St. Helens showed us a lot of fantastic things. God gave us an actual laboratory where, rather than historical science, we could actually see canyons and stratified layers and polystrata fossils and coal layers. And things formed very, very quickly, including the Little Colorado River Canyon, which formed as a result of a, a breached dam a couple of years after the volcano had erupted. And it carved out this uh, canyon in a matter of uh, hours, like minutes almost. And it, actually, there, there are some issues with that in comparison to the Grand Canyon. But um, and that being mainly a lot of it was cut through the uh, the layers that had been laid down very quickly as a result of the uh, volcanic event, uh, Mount St. Helens showed us three different events that, that form finely stratified layers, each in a matter of minutes, not over, never seen millions of years of time. As far as Grand Canyon, uh, on, on the raft trip that we do now with our rim and raft trips, I don't lead trips through the entire canyon anymore. Uh, they turn into kind of raft trips and I'm really more of a creation evangelist, if you will. So our, we just do that 17-mile trip that goes around Horseshoe Bend. Well, the secularists or the atheists always bring up, well, how could you have had this massive water flow that makes this huge turn around Horseshoe Bend? And I think that that's another fair question. But water always follows the path of least resistance. And if you go around Horseshoe Bend, you'll notice a series of about eight different faults that I believe cut and cut and turn that water where it was eroding. Once it first cut down into the, the layers, breaking out the loose rock from where those faults are, they started to bend around and cut straight down into those layers. And that's the reason that you have uh, some meanders or some turns in, in uh, the main chasms of Grand Canyon. The water is falling fault lines and breakages uh, most of the side canyons are um, actually called barb canyons, and, and the flow of erosion that would have cut them are the opposite direction. So if the river is going this direction, I don't know if you can see this on the screen here, the barb canyons are coming back the other direction. And I think when the, first, the canyon first formed, the water went over the upwork, and as the chasm formed in the center, the waters then started coming back and dropping into the chasm and going on through the canyon. 
So I think that the meandering loops were probably having to do with some faults and other reasons that the water took the path of least resistance and the barb canyons going the wrong directions on the sides were backflow as the water dumped into the forming canyon and as they brought rock and debris and then joined with the waters flowing down the canyon, they even helped carve the canyon even, even quicker and faster and deeper. That's another great answer, uh, Ross. I appreciate it. Uh, George, I apologize. You're going to say something. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I can agree with that. As an engineer, uh, we, we, we've done lots of um, experiments on channelization and uh, you, fi you find uh, based on the, on the material that water will find the path of least resistance. And we, we've done that for numerous ma different materials and we fi find the same thing happening over and over again. You know, you know, George, as an engineer, you know this, but water possesses much more power than, than we oh. realize. Over eight pounds per gallon. You're talking millions of gallons pouring through. But oh, they definitely. Can, we use water in industry now to cut hardened steel. A stream of water under 50,000 PSI. And the key is to have a little bit of grit in that water and it'll cut right through hardened steel. So this water... Uh, literally hundreds of millions of pounds of water rushing through the canyon, carrying grains of sand up to the size of 200,000 pound boulders at 100 plus miles an hour uh, would have done a lot of damage and ripped through and cut Grand Canyon quickly, including following the fault lines with a few turns in the canyon. It, and, and, there, and there's evidence of that, uh, Russ. I think you probably know about the Orville Dam failure mm -hmm. where where huge amounts of water literally uh, spewed out of the dam, um, eroding concrete as well as the base beneath the concrete, which was basaltic rock, cutting it like um, a hot knife through butter. So there's lots mm -hmm. of observable evidence where water uh, can actually cut even through rock. It's, it's unbelievable that people can deny stuff like that. It's, it's observable evidence. What else can I say? You know, the Bible warns us to beware of science falsely so-called, knowledge false knowledge. And a lot of historical science, and it's not necessarily someone meant to be evil, but when you take today's rate and make determinations of something that happened a thousand years in the past, you can be way off on your answers because the present is not the key to the past. The global flood is to, is the key to the, to the past geological activity we see on the surface of the earth today what what i, I what i love uh, russ is uh you know so, so many creationists now are doing the operational science to actually prove a lot of these uh facts about the the flood like john mckay and um dr snelling you know with that with that example of the tapete sandstone bent layers uh so so it, it's sort of like put, puts a dent in their explanations they can't sort of um, repeat a lot of those rescue devices they've been using for for decades now. I mean, because we've disproven them. And 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 sorry, I forgot to mention Russ with the limestone issue. Uh, secular geologists have actually done experiments themselves, and they have found that flocculation can occur in turbulent situations. That was one of their objections. That that. Uh, at, you know, with with a flood and the volume of water and the speed, etc., and the turbulence created, that that limestone could never form because of the turbulence. Well, it's been proven flock, flocculate it can flocculate in in turbulent uh, situations. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think I've seen some studies. It's been a few years. I think they were from Indiana State, and um. There was another one, I, I can't remember where they're from now, that showed that uh, these formations can form in, in calm oceans, but also in fast moving water. Yeah. And that, that also went against a lot of the assumptions, the erroneous assumptions made by secular geology. Uh, more and more science, as real science comes to the head, uh, we see that real science is a believer's true friend, always has been and always will be. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I, I always say it's 2022 and it's a great time to be a young earth creationist. Just as the Bible says in, in 2 Peter 3, they're willingly ignorant of the creation, the flood, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, and the coming judgment. So I appreciate that uh, yeah. response. Gentlemen, uh, 
this question here comes in from God and Gunclinger. And he asks, uh, Russ, I've got it up on screen here. He asks, at Standing for Truth, was the ocean level low enough after the flood for animals to walk from the ark to Australia? Uh, Russ, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my first thought, I think that's how George got there, if I recall. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to turn that one over to George. Uh, for the answer to one, but no, um, uh, yeah. Ru Ru Russ, I'm a, I'm a scuba diver. I actually swam under the water. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, well, that I don't know if that would qualify as macro evolution or not, but we won't go there. Uh, yes, actually, I've seen uh, secular textbooks that teach that the ocean waters used to be 400 feet lower than they are today. And then the secular books claim ice masses melted, filled in the oceans to where they are today. So my first thought is don't destroy Western civilization because the ice caps are melting. That's been going on since the end of the global flood, which the ice caps were a direct result of. But regarding the, uh, uh, the water and animals uh, spreading out after the flood, when uh, Noah and his family got off of the ark, the ocean waters again were about 400 feet lower than they are today. You could you could get land masses, ice bridges, and continental shelves exposed, so animal animals could move around the globe. It didn't take a great deal of time for animals to spread out around the world. Um, this also has to do with why we have different looking people groups. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll explain that in in the same context. So that does that work, Donnie? Absolutely. Yep. A lot of, you know, it's an issue today, and I oftentimes get asked by well-meaning people, but also Darwinists as well, well, how do you creationists, how do you Bible believers explain why we have different races today? And my answer is this. We don't have different races. We have one race, the human race. That's the only race described in, in the Bible. But we do have different looking people groups. We're not different races. We're all still humans, all made in the image of God. Well, after the flood, people gathered at Babel and God had told them to spread out and they refused to do so. So God came down during the days of Peleg um, and confused languages at the Tower of Babel. The Bible says that the earth was divided in the days of Peleg. Now, his name translates furrowed or divided. Well, the animals had already spread out. The continents had already broken up, uh, continental drift, if you will, during the global flood. Well, people then also could spread out around the globe because, again, the ocean waters were 400 feet lower. Now, people spread out around the globe. And slowly after the flood had ended, and we're talking 500 to 800 years now after the flood, the oceans slowly were cooling and cooling. It's estimated the flood waters might have been as much as 120 degrees Fahrenheit because the erupting fountains were super hot waters. So the oceans were slowly cooling and the ice age came to an end. People had spread out. Now the ice caps in the lower latitudes melted back quickly, filling in the oceans and people were separated now by languages, nations, islands, and continents. People had to marry within the gene pools captured on a, sp a particular continent, piece of land, island, etc. Slight adaptational changes caused by the sorting or the loss of the starting gene pools coming off of the ark there were four couples on the ark, Noah's three sons and their families. Slight adaptational changes in each of the uh, gene pools led to the different looking people groups we have today. The biggest difference is the color of our skin, how much melanin we have in our skin cells. Myself, I'm melanin challenged. I have some friends that are melanin rich and everybody in between. But we, that's the biggest difference in people groups. We didn't evolve to different levels like Darwin has teach, a very dangerous teaching. We are all made in the image of God. And that's the reason we can, we can still do blood transfusions and kidney transplants from people all around the globe because we didn't evolve to different levels. We were all made in the image of God. But now as the ice caps melted, the oceans were filled in and we can't uh, walk all over the globe today. Yeah, uh, Russ, uh, one, another important fact, um, Dr. Jensen and AIG have done a lot of study into the uh, Y chromosome haplogroups, and uh, they pretty much confirm uh, the biblical history as well as written history with regards to the migration of um, a lot of these people through through various parts of the world. So 
that's another, uh, I guess, uh, operational science that sort of confirms what the Bible uh, is is actually saying about uh, the way the way uh, the nations were divided and ended up where they are. You know, absolutely. In fact, National Geographic, which is no friend to the biblical accounts, they did a study on the human genome and came to the conclusion all humans come from one of four distinct gene pools. There were four gene pools on the ark. Noah, his three sons, and their wives. And we also have the Y chromosome Adam, where studies have shown that all men from around the world have descended from one man known as the Y chromosome Adam, and that we've all descended from one woman known as the African Eve or the mitochondrial Eve. And in fact, Science News did a, did a posting on this and said that uh, D- studies on DNA mutation rates indicate Eve may have lived just 6,000 years ago. So it, real science doesn't go against the Bible. When, when science appears to go against the Bible, it's generally historical science, which is really somebody's inter- biased interpretation. Biased interpretations may go against what the Bible says, but operational science is a believer's true friend. And like I said, always has been, always will be. Yeah, well, one of the interesting, I was, I was reading an article just recently about a bone that was found in the Middle East that placed, it was a hominid bone, by the way, it placed at 120,000 years before the uh, so-called African um, exodus. And now what they're proposing is, their, their rescue advice now is, well, the African exodus must have occurred a lot earlier than we thought. Hmm. That's how they solve that issue about because we always say that the Middle East was the center of civilization and, and it actually exploded out uh, in outwards from there rather than the secular explanation which says mm-hmm. Africa everything occurred in Africa and then mm-hmm. they migrated north yeah. well one thing I could certainly add to that too and again uh, Russ another very thorough answer I, I love that. I appreciate it. I believe the migration patterns as well after Babel that you're talking about, I believe that they could explain a lot of the so-called transitional forms or examples of ape to man evolution. The evolutionists point to such as Neanderthals, Arachnids, Nelidi, uh, the hobbits that they'll oftentimes point to, because as you have these subpopulations migrating, they become isolated. What results is inbreeding. And then those recessive mutations that are not yet manifested, they're in hidden form, they're revealed, and that leads to rapid genetic degeneration. And after just a few generations, you can have these anomalous features pop up, Mm -hmm. become fixed, and then the evolutionists pick up those bones and they say, look, transitional or primitive, when Mm -hmm. in fact, a lot of it is due to degeneration from isolation and inbreeding. Hmm. Uh, that's a that's a very good point. And one of my messages is the top 10 uh, Darwinian frauds in the textbooks. And I, I cover a lot of the hominids and, you know, basically all the hominids. And you just really uh, just uh, more or less uh, discuss this. But all of their supposed hominids, the supposed closest link between ape and man have turned out to be either 100 percent ape, 100 percent human or 100% frauds, or you could say mistakes. Right. When, you ma- when you make a mistake, we all make a mistake. When you find it's a mistake, you move on. But when you continue to teach it, now that becomes a fraud. And the history books are full of fraudulent hominids from uh, Piltdown Man to Nebraska Man to, you know, on and on it goes. And uh, I think we need to, there comes a point in time when you just realize you can't believe what what you're being told when it goes against God's word, you need to be able to stand on your own and say, you know, this goes against God's word. I, your history shows you're always, you're always wrong on these things. I think I'm going to look for reasons to believe the word of God. And there are a lot of good uh, creation scientists and, and speakers that uh, can can get information to you. I would suggest put your trust in, in the word of God and contact uh, and get some help from some people who have studied it and they can answer those questions for you. There are just so many misleading frauds in the textbooks and what the bottom line with biology is there are two, there are two real bottom lines. One, they can't get life started. The origin of life is a, is a tremendous stumbling block for Darwinists to the point they will claim, of course, evolution has nothing to do with, so with the start of life. So 
you know, basically they're saying the origin of species has nothing to do with the well origin of the species. And the other, the even bigger problem they have is that um, changes, adaptations, um, Donnie, as you were discussing, are caused by the sorting or the loss of their already existing gene pool, right. not by the gain of the new and beneficial uh, gene pool. It's how I, I show people how to scientifically destroy Darwinism in, in four seconds flat, and that is that gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. The changes are caused, adaptations, you may call those microevolution, microadaptations, microtransitions, all the same thing. These microadaptations are caused by the sorting or loss of information. Gene pools get weaker and weaker and weaker. If, and natural selection, which there's no selector standing there. We just we named it natural selection. I call it actually God's quality assurance program. <laughs> You know, gene pools are losing information, and if they went unchecked, everything would go extinct in about 1,500 years. But things lose too much information, gene depletion, natural selection removes them. God's quality assurance program removes them so they don't corrupt the gene pools. So gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility, which is why they can't find any viable examples of Darwinian or, Darwinian or macro evolution. They show lots of examples of biblically correct micro evolution, micro adaptations. And keep in mind, we're told 10 times in Genesis that plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. That's all that real science finds is that kinds will only bring forth after their kind with micro changes within the kind caused by the sorting or loss of the starting genetic information. Amen. Uh, Amen. Russ, Very well said, Russ. Um, I find it funny. One thing I'll say, George, and then and then yeah. I'll let you go uh, real quick. And we'll start winding it down as well. I just looked at the time and wow, Russ, thank you so much for <laughs> giving us your time tonight. Time flies by. We are already uh, over the two hour mark. Um, but I just find it funny because evolutionists, as you're pointing out, they'll look to natural selection, mutations, natural selection doesn't make anything new. It's a fine tuning process, as you um, pointed out, keeps the species as strong as they can be. Mutations that they'll point to as the source for novel variation, genetic variation that selection can apparently act upon for uh, you know the additions of, of true novelties in terms of evolution are damaging. They cause disease, they accumulate. It's a downhill process rather than an uphill process, which uh, fish to fisherman evolution would would require. So those are some great points. Uh, you know, a loss of genetic uh, variation and information is not going to uh, explain novel body plans, so on and so forth. So I appreciate that, Russ and George. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I was just going to add a, a little bit more to what uh, Russ had said about um, all the frauds and whatever. Um, they're very protective of um, contradictory evidence, if I can call it that. Uh, they won't tell the students about uh, the abiogenesis problem, but they will talk to the nth degree about um, the Miller-Urey experiment as if that solves the abiogenesis issue. But uh, it was, there was an interesting example, Russ, where I was at my daughter's birthday and obviously her friends are involved in um, scientific research themselves. So I, I posed the questions to them and I said, hey, how do you explain uh, soft tissue bones in 70 million year old um, dinosaur fossils? They go, that's impossible. I said, you, you've never read the scientific research? She goes, no, I don't believe there is any. So even though these people have gone to university for probably four to five years, they were, they were never told about this fact that they actually are finding soft tissues uh, in all sorts of fossils now, not just, uh, you know, dinosaur bones, but a lot of other things. And, um, yeah, uh, something that just came to my mind about C14, Russ, I forgot to mention it. Dr. Brian Thomas, and I forget the other scientist's name at ICR, looked at bones with purely, purely uh, trying to explain this contamination issue. And what they did was they measured the, the amount of C14 inside the bone and compared the C14 to the outside of the bone. And what they found was there was more C14 inside the bone than outside the bone. 
So if it was contamination, you'd expect it to be the other way around. Mm -hmm. But the other important fact that they found was the ratio of C14 outside to inside was almost identical in all samples. They even went as far as to say, if you took a sample of your own bone and did that particular experiment, you would find the same ratio in your bone to those fossils. Hmm. So I found that I found that that very very revealing. Hmm. So I, I can't important. see I can't see how they can keep going on this C14 contamination business. Well, the, the same way they go on about the dinosaur, they just don't tell anybody about that. We see a lot of that. <laughs> not getting another subject in the news today, but if there's something that the the groups that control the information don't want people to to know about they just don't tell them and and yeah you know the, the dinosaur information should be front page news but dinosaurs are one of the five pillars of old earth beliefs which are the foundation for darwinism naturalism humanism etc if they lose those pillars they lose everything so yeah. they just have to keep the information from people it's up to folks like you and i uh, we need to get the information out there and i really appreciate yeah. uh, your guys program and what you do to reach people with this information I Thanks. appreciate Tony, that. Tony, can, I, can I ask the last question? Because we're up to two hours and twelve minutes now. Yeah, the, I was the, just gonna the, I was just gonna wrap it up there, but Georgia, if you had like a really quick final question. Yeah, the, the, this co this comes from a recent debate uh, that Jackson had with um, I think it was Professor McQueen on the Cambrian explosion. His his question was effectively uh, how come we don't find animals such as sharks and marine mammals in the Cambrian layers? Specifically, he was talking about sharks' teeth hmm. because his argument was shark shark uh, uh, shed so many teeth in their lifetime and there would have been some kind of remnant uh, fossil of a shark tooth in the Cambrian. And uh, my, my explanation to that was uh, the absence of evidence is an evidence. I mean... There's so many examples of that kind of argument. That's a logical fallacy, but I'd like to hear what you might have to say about it. Well, I was thinking pretty much what you said about it. The lack of evidence is not evidence that something was or wasn't there. The, uh, the layers, the lower layers were most likely formed. Uh, the first things to have been buried would have been the, the low, the shallow seas, and such, and I think that's where you, you wouldn't have found sharks necessarily um, in those lowest uh, layers, some of the, the lower swamp areas is what I'm talking about. So um, I think that the layers starting out in where you find the Cambrian explosion, et cetera, are probably some of those low, shallow uh, inlets and such, and probably freshwater uh, creatures and lack of uh, shark's teeth. There is no more of a problem from a from a flood standpoint than it is finding, you know, shark's teeth at uh, 12,000 feet above sea level today, which we do find in uh, tall mountain ranges and such. So lack of evidence is a logical fallacy. And it's just, um, I don't really see a point in really the question, to be honest with you. Yeah. It's especially because according to their own logic, Ross, we have tons of examples of so-called living fossils or an example like the coelacanth where it was, from my understanding, even used as an index fossil, apparently mm -hmm. went extinct. And according to their own geologic time frame and model, we have millions of years with no evidence of the existence of the coelacanth. And all of a sudden we find them swimming around today on the earth in present time. So apparently, according to that logic, the coelacanths didn't exist for millions of years. And yet, obviously, they did. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, no, I, th I think that's a great explanation, uh, gentlemen, to that uh, question. And again, thank you so much, uh, Russ. This has been awesome. This has been fantastic. Uh, lots of compliments, lots of great feedback. Everybody in the chat, please share this around as uh, the truth is important and we want to get this information out to as many people as possible. Uh, Russ, you've given us over two hours of your time. Uh, time has flown by. I want to hand it over to you for some final words, some final thoughts before we close it down for the day. Well, thank you, Donnie. And thank you, George. I enjoyed chatting with both of you and enjoyed your input. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my message would, would simply be that real science 
is a believer's best friend. It's a true friend of, of, of Christianity. Historical science is another issue. So when we, when we look at the world around us, realize we all have the same evidence. The evidence has to be interpreted. Because someone sells you or provides you with only a negative interpretation that goes against the Bible, remember, it's their worldview that goes against Scripture that they're coming from. You can, there are lots of good sources to find uh, interpretations that fit the, the Word of God, and most of these interpretations fit much, much better than do the secular misinterpretations of the evidence. So real science is on our side. We can trust God's word, word for word and cover to cover, as I like to say, put your trust in the word of God and uh, we're gonna enjoy eternity together with him in, in an awesome place. Thank you very much. And and Russ, Russ, to, pro to prove your point, I put operational science uh, into effect myself I was told to use alcohol to clean the bathroom. It really works, apparently. The more I drink, the cleaner it looks. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, maybe uh, as your wife was telling you, you look at that a little closer. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, George. <laughs> uh, you've been fantastic, Russ. Oh, I've, I've got a clo I've got a closing message too, Donny. My usual message. So. Uh, I'd like I'd like to say uh, this pretty much. Um, I think I've said it on, on almost all our streams. Uh, may the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. I just uh, realized I was on mute. So great final words, uh, Russ and George. Uh, fantastic uh, input as well, George. Again, Russ. Thank you so much for the time uh, that you've given to us uh, today. Um, God bless. And to the audience, thank you for tuning in. Standing for Truth is out.